Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. I have a very interesting piece of test equipment sitting in storage. In fact, it's been in storage for quite some time and I keep passing by it. And I'm figuring to myself, what should I do with this thing? Should I use it for parts or should I completely restore this? Now, rather than me putting this thing on the bench, opening it up and just looking through it quickly and making this decision, I figured I would share this experience with all of you. So let's take a look inside this thing and see what I'm up against if I'm going to restore it or whether I should just strip this thing down. You can leave your comments below and tell me what you think. Let's get started. Here you are sitting at the service bench in front of this piece of test equipment. So what are we looking at here? This is a Sonazon SO-100. What does this device do? It's used for measuring the thickness of metals using ultrasonic frequencies. So way back when, this was a pretty high-tech device. And when we take a look at the tags on the back side of the unit, you'll see that it was used in a pretty high-tech facility. I imagine this was probably used for inspecting welds or something like that. On the face of the unit here, we have a range selector with a bunch of different colors in circles. So I imagine that this is used to calibrate the device for looking at different thicknesses of metals. Here we have an on and gain control. Down here is a calibrate position, most likely to calibrate the trace on the screen. Over here we have calibrate size, again, most likely for the screen. A clipping control, a jack down here that would most likely connect up to a head unit that would be used to measure the thickness of the steel. Now, I don't have that particular head unit, so if I was to try and restore this thing, I would have to fabricate that head unit to make this thing work correctly and then calibrate it to do that. AC on lamp right here, really big. I guess you could call it cover for the lamp. There's just a standard, it looks like a like a 47 bulb or something underneath there. Just a huge cover on top. Kind of an interesting, interesting power on lamp. So the case is louvered to obviously allow the thing to breathe. The handle is still in really nice condition on the top. There's a tag on the top side here that says name inspection to room 1171 building M3. Uh, what does it say? The tag is a little bit torn back here. Something else, 1128, building M1. Oh, it says from, possibly. That could be from room 1128. Item name, Sona's on. So, it's a tag on it. And there's a little bit of a cal sticker here, too. Not much information on here, but looks like a, a cal sticker of some sort. We'll take a closer look at that here in just a moment. So what I'll do is I'll turn the unit around. We'll take a look at the back side and then we'll try and get this thing apart and see what's inside it. Here we are looking at the back side of the Sonazon. And as you can see, there's more louvers here. Lots of louvers on the case. Good ventilation. This is the connection for the power cord that would connect to the mains. Two fuse holders right here. Another jack on the back that isn't labeled. And it looks like there's three connections in this jack. It could be possibly four connections, considering the case as well. They most likely have this cap here to keep dust and debris out of it, or just to keep noise out of the circuitry. By putting this on here, that will shield it, shield all of these connections right here. The tag here says, Sonazon, manufactured by the Magnaflux Corporation, a subsidiary of General Mills. Interesting. It says, made under license from General Motors Corporation. And this came from Space Technology Laboratories Incorporated. So that's a very interesting company. If you get a chance, you may want to Google that, check that out, and get an idea of why they are using such an accurate device. So getting into the case doesn't look all that incredibly difficult. I see two screws here, so one here, one here, and there's two on the sides. There's really nothing on the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is reposition the camera and we're gonna try and get inside the device. I've removed the two screws on the side. These are the two screws here. So there's one right at the front here and one right at the front on this side. And now let's remove these two screws and that looks like the only screws holding this thing together. A 
kind of interesting that they would have this little washer here. It interferes with the area of this connection. Just kind of bizarre. You can see how it kind of runs into the area where the connection for the line cord would be. So I don't know if that would be factory. That might have been an afterthought or something like that. I don't know. Because I don't have another one to compare to. So, so I removed this. I left this off of here because this is attached to the case of the unit. And as you can see, this is fastened to the inside. So if I remove this, it's going to try and pull this through and break this little chain. So I think at this point, this cover should come off. So let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. There it is. And I think it's going to possibly hit the lens of the camera as I'm lifting this. So what I'm going to do is I'll just tip this back just a little bit. Maybe I can get it out of here. And in there. There it is. Just let this down for a moment and put the case on the floor over here. So already I see some glass mic capacitors. These are nice capacitors. Move this stuff out of the way. And let's take a look at this side here first. And it's looking really clean. So I'm going to move a couple of things around here and focus in on some stuff and I'll be right back. The device looks like it is really well put together. I have to admit, really big power transformer for what this thing does. So it has a 2x2. These are a standard high voltage rectifier used in many oscilloscopes for the high voltage supply. So this would be the high voltage supply for the CRT right here. And this one here would be the low voltage rectifier. So what this thing is, let's find out. Let's take it out. It looks like a 5y3 or a 5y4, but it has cathodes. Actually, it has cathode sleeves inside here. So it's a 6087, which is a 5Y3 WGTB. Now, a 5Y3 does not have a cathode sleeve inside it like that. They're directly heated tubes. So what they've done is the 6087 would have the cathode sleeve, which would basically make this a controlled warm-up time 5Y3. So 5Y3s are basically you turn the switch on, okay, you have high voltage that fast. With a 6087, when you turn this thing on, there's a filament inside that sleeve that's going to have to warm up. So this is going to have a controlled warm-up time of probably about you know 10 to 15 seconds, something like that. So whether this is a 5Y3 or they just put an industrial version in here, maybe they don't need that controlled warm-up time. Yeah, see, it just says 5Y3 here. Let's move this forward. It just says 5Y3 here. So the controlled warm-up time wouldn't be too big of a deal in a case like this. So they just put an industrial tube in here, a really high quality tube, that's all. Kind of interesting. Lots of capacitors and they all look like they're wax capacitors down in here. So you can see the wax down in here. There's another capacitor back here, another one here. They have yellow bands on them and they look like they're sweating. So they may have an oil inside these ones here. They have a little pipe that they've soldered. Sometimes that's filled. You can see they're kind of sweaty right here. So, and there's a bunch of wax capacitors all along the top. You see the wax here. And this is another wax capacitor. And this looks like a wax capacitor and another one over here as well. So you can see that. So lots of wax capacitors bathtub style capacitor right here this one right here 
Glass mic capacitors, those are always really good. Those are a sealed oil capacitor. There's oil in them. Over here, this looks like it's really well put together as well. So this is obviously maybe the front end of the circuitry. Let's zoom on in. Take a closer look at this. We can get this in the shot a bit better. So quite a mixture of capacitors down at the bottom here as well. I'm just going to move this over. You can see that. The diode in here would have to be checked. Electrolytic capacitors all over here. Well, this one here, this one here, this one wouldn't be electrolytic. But chances are it would have to be replaced as well. So these capacitors here, you can see they all look like they're sweating. This one here looks like it's wet as well. And it has this little pipe where they've soldered here. So this, there could be oil inside this shell. Electrolytic, dry electrolytic capacitor here and here. The resistors are probably going to be okay. Just because they're the Allen Bradley style ones. So I imagine most of these capacitors are probably... Well, <laughs> these are dry to begin with. Dry electrolytic, but you know when I say dried up, I mean like they're, you know, done... So down here, let's see. Yeah, have to remove those to inspect these. The cardboard shell doesn't rotate on this capacitor right here, so they're fixed pretty good. This one down here, oh, that's really bizarre. It looks like they've, when they took the shell of this capacitor and snapped it off so basically what happens is they're printing off half shells and what they're doing is they're putting the cap inside and then they're molded together it looks like a chunk of maybe another capacitor broke off and they've actually printed onto that chunk that broke off that's kind of interesting it's printed right onto that so that's there from the factory i don't know if i can rotate that so you can see that you see that Zoom on in just a little bit more. It's a big chunk here. And what they've done is they've printed on that on that chunk. You might be able to see it a bit better if I do that. See that? A big chunk sticking off the side of the cap. They actually printed on it. That's interesting. So all of these would have to go at any rate. You can see how these are kind of sweaty looking. So, some really good Allen Bradley resistors in here as well. Lots of really good resistors in here. So, it doesn't look like a, a super job to go through and redo this. Like, you know, just standard capacitors and things like that. And this is this film. So, what I'm going to do is, I'll put this down here. There's a chain on the top, so it looks like there's some form of a drive for this roll. And see how it says stop right here? You can see this is kind of breaking at the top. I'm going to back on out of this just a little bit. So if I rotate that control on the face of the unit, so the, the control is down here, the one with the colored dots. So if I rotate that, you can see how it's moving that film so that you can select the correct scale for the color dot. Now, I really don't want to move this too much if I'm going to try and restore this because as you can see, it looks like it's cracking up here. See that? Looks like it's actually broken right at the end there. I think the there's still a few scales on here. Yeah, you can see that. So this would be white. And then red. So look at that scale. It's all broken up here, right? So just for safekeeping, I'm going to wind this back onto the roll like so. It looks like maybe the alignment was off and it was catching this. Maybe that's what broke that. I'm just going to keep that over here like so because I don't want to damage this. I'll take a look at the face here. I'm at the stop on the other side. So right about there would be about the safest. You can see that, how it's kind of binding up. I think it is an alignment issue. That's what's caused this issue. I imagine one of these could be easily made. Wouldn't be too big of a deal. So, that's this side here. I'll just zoom on out again. 
So that's this side over here. The mat around just a bit. Some controls in the back, most likely focus and stuff. I'm thinking that's usually what they do for focus and intensity is they stand the focus and intensity off because there's high voltage on these things, usually negative voltage. So they have this big spacer right here to keep this away from the chassis so that nothing happens, so there's no arcing. Because, you know, there's some pretty close tolerances inside this thing, and if this is the case of this is, you know, mounted to this, there's a chance of arcing and things shorting out. This is very common in Tektronix equipment, things like that as well. The oscilloscopes, they have these spacers here and an isolated adjustment here. Looking at the other side... So what this is, is a motor-driven capacitor. So what I'm doing is I'm just turning this around here. And as you can see, as I'm moving the motor, the plates are moving in and out of each other. So they're most likely using this to create a sweep of some sort. This situation was very common in sweep setups to do alignments way back when. Nice little motor. Boy, is that ever smooth. It's just as smooth as glass. Over here, it looks like we have an oscillator circuit. So this is gonna be the oscillator that's controlled by that one knob on the front that has all those different colored dots. So each color dot indicates a different frequency or different coil. So you can see on the top here, they've marked the colors for the coils to make the alignment easier. So this would be the coil and the capacitor to align the green band and the yellow band and the orange band. And we have blue, white, and red over there. Be interesting to see what frequency this thing is operating at. A bunch of dye film capacitors on this side. These are good capacitors. So, yeah, they're mixing, you know, capacitors that aren't that incredibly leaky with ones that are incredibly leaky over here. So, wax capacitor in here would have to go. Nice RF choke right there. So, looking at the bottom here. An oscillator tube, I could have almost told you that that was a 6C4, and that's exactly what it is. A 6C4 is a very common oscillator tube used in many, many different types of circuits. And the tube itself looks like it's just about brand new. Very nice looking tube, 6C4, Sylvania. And again, for those of you that are new to this channel, touching the glass of a vacuum tube is fine when it's cold. And of course, the unit is discharged. It's not like the glass that you find on those headlights and things where they tell you not to touch the glass. This is just standard glass, not a big deal. 6AU6 tubes down here. So you just push down on the shields, give them a twist, and they pop off. And these are 6136 tubes, five star again. So really high quality tubes right here. They're putting the best of the best in here. Look at that. General Electric 5 Star 6136. Doesn't get much better than that. After these, you know, the quality of these types of tubes, you know, the next step up would be like a Bendix Red Bank or something like that, right? That is the absolute premium type of vacuum tube. I'll get into explaining about the Bendix Red Bank tubes here in a future video. These are 12AU7s. Oh, look at that. And they're clear top 12AU7s. The audio guys would be crazy over these things. That means that they put the getter compound on the side. These look really nice in audio service because you can see the uh, filaments glow. So I'm just carefully rocking that to move the tube out of the socket. See the getter compound is on the side of the tube which leaves the top portion of the tube nice and clear so when they're on they look really nice because you can see the glow of the filaments there. So these tubes are very sought after. And there's two of them here, both RCAs. And it looks like there's another two 12AU7 tubes over here. I see 12AU7 and 12AU7. Look at that. Clear tops as well. And they look like they're brand spanking new. Same as the other ones. RCA. Very nice. These tubes look so nice when they're glowing, it's almost a shame to cover them up. 
Over here is two zero way two. So these are regulator tubes. These tubes here usually just act as shunt regulators. Made in France. Very nice. And the exact same tube, made in France, 0A2. So it looks like they're putting everything in pairs here. Very nice. Lots of really nice tubes in this thing. Filter choke for the power supply. Filter capacitor. And if we look over here, you see on the bottom, you see there's a little light here. And on the bottom is a disc that's attached to this motor here, and there's a sensor on the top, a photo sensor. So if I zoom on in, we should see just a little area <clears throat> that that light should be able to shine in. And you can see it. There's a little rectangular window right here. See that? Right there on that tube. Looks like they've covered this up with tape and just left the smallest little rectangular window right there. So the light will shine into that, and then of course when the motor comes here, it'll block the light. And as this is turning around, it'll let the light through again, so this is acting as some form of a switch. Now what they're doing with this, I don't know, maybe start, start and stop of a sweep or a marker or something like that. It's used to control something, and you would adjust this screw here and you can slide this one forward or backwards in order to adjust that. So, if you wanted it to say, say it was uh, needed to be dark to this point right here, you would just loosen this up and then slide this out a little bit more. So that's turning. I wonder if this works. Boy, that's just as smooth as glass. I wonder if this would actually work. I'm excited to see. I'm very tempted to put power to this thing and just see if this thing will spin. Eastern Air Devices, Hysteresis Synchronous Motor. So accurate motor. Used for timing purposes. And of course, since it has this variable capacitor here, it's definitely going to be used for that. So all in all, on this side here, there's not a whole lot to do, really. It's mostly just fix things. Of course, this capacitor down in here would have to go I would change the die film capacitors anyways, because chances are they're on their way out. What's this block? Sprague. Filter. So it's some form of a filter they're using. Input and output on one side. Interesting to know what's inside there. Probably just a bunch of capacitors and coils and things like that. Very nicely wound coils here. I'm very, very tempted to power this thing up. I'm going to hook this thing up to my isolated current limited power supply. And I'm going to see if this thing spins. Maybe we can even get a trace. Let's try it out. Okay, I have a line cord attached to this. And I'm ready to turn on my isolation transformer and current limited variac supply. So here we go. Let's see what happens. Oh, it's on. Look at that. And that is as smooth as glass. It's very little vibration. It's just so smooth. I if I can get any glowing on the screen, the indicator light is on. Very interesting. Everything's lighting up. Kind of hard to see with all the light shining up. You see the filaments of those tubes. Probably turn off some of the lights here. See the tubes glowing away. See all that glowing in there? 
All that red light that you see shining on the front here is all from that crazy bright indicator light. Boy, you'd be able to see that across a large room. It's probably the reason that they've done that. So what I'm going to do is move this around. I'm going to shut it off and move the face so that we can take a look at the face and see if we can get a trace on this device. Okay, I'm ready to apply power to this again. Let's see what happens. Boy, is that ever bright. I can back this out here and give you an idea of how crazy bright that light is. Look at that, there's a trace. Wow. Calibrate position, so this is just moving it down on the screen. This looks like it's affecting the length. Now that looks a lot brighter in the camera than it actually is. That's about the standard brightness for what you would see on a normal oscilloscope. I'll turn on some lights here, see if I can give you a better idea of how bright that really is. Yeah, kind of hard to get that into perspective. But that's about the normal brightness. So it's not too incredibly bright. It's just because the camera is so close here and the lights are turned down. Let's get rid of that. So get rid of the glare. So it is working. You can see this inner one here. This moves that plastic scale. So I really don't want to move that around too much because that looks like that's going to break. So this is obviously going to be changing. This here is going to be changing the oscillator frequency. So, let's see, so this is the gain control. Look at that. There's gain there. Clipper. There we go. Yeah, it's definitely cleaning that up a whole lot, isn't it? And uh, so if I move this over just a bit, get that out of the way. Change this to different bands. So it's obviously looking for something. So this is on the bottom here. If I back this out, right in this little jack right here in the center, I'll grab a screwdriver and I'll just touch that and see if it makes any movement on the screen here. This one here should do it. It's an insulated handle. I'll just stick that in there. Yeah, and it's, it's sensing it. You can see that. So it looks like it's trying to work. Now, of course, the way that this thing is going to work is going to be greatly affected by those old capacitors because chances are those dry, electro dry electrolytic capacitors are, you know, really done. And then the wax ones are going to be so leaky. So it does look like a really good candidate to restore. And I really don't know how many of these things are left. Kind of would be a shame to tear this thing down, wouldn't it? I don't know. So you tell me your opinion on what you think. Do you think I should just use this thing for parts? Or do you think that we should go through and restore this thing and maybe try and look at the thickness of some metal with it? Thanks for stopping by the lab today. I hope you enjoyed this video involving the Sonazon. If you did enjoy the video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos coming like this in the near future. I have an entire area full of very interesting pieces of test equipment, some of which you've probably never seen before, and we're going to go through all of that stuff together. They use some pretty interesting technologies to do what they need to do. So lots of very interesting videos coming in the near future. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. Don't forget to tap the bell notification so that you get the notifications as soon as I post my videos. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, you're going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I have a lot of very interesting things up there as well, and I'm also sharing some of my inventions and designs there. So lots of very interesting things there. A very active community section as well. Lots of very good people there. So definitely check it out. I'll put the link just below the video in the description under the show more tab. So just below the video, you'll see the description and a show more. Tap the show more tab. It'll expose the link to get there. And I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. So you can just click on that and it'll take you right there if you want to check it out. All right. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.